So aloha ka'ako and welcome to another one of the presentations that is part of the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Once again, we are in the Valkanaka coming from Maui with a very interesting talk about pampas grass from the Maui Invasive Species Committee. And as we, I'm Beth, hi, with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council and online pest reporting 643pest.org, as well as I work with MISC. And I'm going to be putting up a poll that is just asking for a little bit of information about your background. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Serena with MISC. All right, aloha mai kako, everybody. Mahalo nui for joining us today for our Pampas update of 2021 uh, with the Mali Invasive Species Committee. My name is Serena Fukushima and I am the PR Education Specialist for MISC. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, we are recording this presentation. It will be available afterwards on the DLNR website that has the calendar of events as well as past recordings from um, all of our presentations this month um, across the state. We're also recording and streaming live on Facebook. So aloha to everybody who's joining us on Facebook. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we won't be able to see you or hear you, so please put any questions or comments in the chat or the question and answer box on the bottom. Um, if you're joining on Facebook, then please put any questions you have for our speakers um, in the comment section on Facebook. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'll let Beth give you guys a few more seconds to fill out that poll. Thank you so much for filling that out. It's really helpful for us in planning future high sound events. Yes, thank you. And if anybody is going to do it, you have five more seconds. And it looks like we have, I'll share this with you very briefly, but we have folks joining us from throughout the state as well as the continental United States and from a lot of different backgrounds. So mahalo for sharing that information with us. Awesome. All right. Well, I am really excited to introduce um, our speakers today. We have Ras Kamimoto. He's a field technician with the Maui Invasive Species Hamakuapoko plant crew. He started at MISC as an AmeriCorps intern um, in 2016, came on board as an employee in 2017. Also presenting alongside him is Bill, Billy Pacheco, who is also a field technician with the Hamakuapoko plant crew. He started as a Nahua Ho'ohuli Ikopono intern in 2016. He was a year round intern, just like Ross, and then employed in 2017 as well. So I think also really great examples of um, how internships and volunteering and getting involved with organizations can pay off and lead into a job. Also here is Mike Aid, who's our plant crew coordinator. He's here in support of Billy and Ross for any questions that may come up at the end and also to just share some of his institutional knowledge in being with MISC and working with invasive plants for over 20 years. And just wanna give a shout out. We also have our Hana Maikonia crew joining us and our attendees. They're here to support Billy and Ross as well. So we have our whole MISC plant crew here with us today virtually. Um, so mahalo everybody for joining us. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Billy and Ross. Mahalo. Hello everyone, um, I'm Ross and talking with me is Billy. Today uh, we'll be talking about the Pampas update. Um, and yeah, Mike, Mike is uh, pictured several times here. Right on. So pampas grass and its impacts. Cortadera jubata or jubata grass and Cortadera solowana, also known as pampas grass, are both invasive grasses that originally brought over as an ornamental plant and now known to cause a threat to our ecosystem. Although it's almost impossible at times to distinguish the two, which is why we, we, we refer both to these plants as uh, pampas grass. Aggressive jubata clone itself is the reason why it's on the state Hawaii noxious weed list. Unlike Selawana, which needs both male and female to reproduce, but we're also seeing how aggressive invasive tactics are. Um, they take roots in a variety of habitats across the island, 
but our presentation will focus exclusively on East Maui, Halakla, Kula, Makawao, Upper Haiku, Waikamoe, and Leeward side. Um, pampas can cause a threat to our ecosystem by overcrowding, outcompeting native plants. In drier areas, it creates tons of biomass that can be a potential fire hazard. And it starts to flower around June or July, which is the best time to find pampas because of how easy it is to see from air or ground. Um, and more importantly, it hasn't dispersed any seeds yet. Each flowering head or plume can contain 10,000 plus seeds and dispersal of seeds can be widespread. Um, 20 miles out and in Hawaii, we can even probably possibly see even more widespread seeds. Um, in wet areas, we've seen it germinate straight on the actual plant itself. Um, if you look at the next picture, <clears throat> and you see this slide, um, this was in Waikamoi area where we were walking and surveying for pampas. Um, this was actually found by Ross by air. We had just one angle between the clouds where we could see just a couple feather heads sticking right underneath the actual flume. And um, later in the presentation, you'll see that picture from a different angle. And then you can go next slide. Um, you can see kind of a dry versus wet, but also on the left side, we have a Silawana um, type of plume. You can see it kind of has a bigger tassel, more puffy looking. On the right side, this is where uh, another angle shot of how we seen that uh, seed head germinating just right there um, towards the end of our surveying season in Waikamoe. All right, you the next photo. And of course, um, we're not just in remote rugged zones. Um, a lot of times too, we have to be controlling and kind of involve ourselves in the community and do residential work. So, um, this is kind of one area we've been treating in Kula um, and also making friends as well. So Pampas on Maui, um, this is more of a historical recent findings, kind of what we found. Um, we're gonna talk about how we found this Pampas. Uh, we're relying on using historical data to predict future findings by surveying and monitoring site specific locations. We also had some recent findings in some areas that aren't really in our historical buffer. Um, every year, we usually get a couple of finds from the ranchers or the park. For example, Woody from the park um, helped us locate a few plants that were in the park last year that we were able to find afterwards uh, by helicopter. Um, our coordinator is usually good about reaching out back to these other guys that are bringing in all the information and trying to get a data point for us to go find the plant or um, any other further information that uh, would help us. Um, we also came across some findings through community engagement. So sometimes we even have residents that uh, help us determine where plants might be, or they might see some uh, on a bordering property or whatnot. So we use that as well. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to describe all the areas that we were working. Um, the first area we're doing was uh, Haleaka Ranch, uh, mainly open grassland, cattle, graze fields, uh, kind of dispersed patches of gorse, a lot of animals, deer, pig, goat, pheasant. Uh, there's old, gro old growth koa and ohia field uh, Gulches, sometimes there's a few lava cave tube type structures. Uh, there's a few dense patches of eucalyptus forests and at higher elevation kind of turns more rocky shrubland. Uh, the range for this is about 4,000 to 8,000 feet. Uh, just wanna explain these maps real quick. Uh, on the ground, we buffer a five meter uh, radius around us. And uh, on ground, we buffer a 15 meter radius around us. And uh, each one of the buffers that we go to, if it's easily accessible, uh, has a radius of 200 meters. And the more remote locations uh, only have 20 meters. And historically, we go back to old points and we fill in uh, these buffers just because of uh, how prolific seed 
uh, how, how much of a prolific seeder this, this plant is. Just want to explain, uh, kind of describe the terrain here. There's a few kind of open dry areas. Uh, oftentimes the plants kind of munched on by the goats or whatnot and kind of dying looking. Other times it's hidden in the gorse. The only time we'll see it is when the seed heads popping out and uh, most of the time we kind of find them in the gulches. Uh, for poly poly uh, or Kula Forest Reserve, uh, you can kind of see the picture here. It's kind of thick, dense, a lot of down trees, uh, blackberry. Um, the range kind of uh, goes from 4,000 to 7,500 feet. There's thick forests of black wattle, pine, blackberry patches dispersed throughout the understory. Patches of open grassland, temperate forests, shrubland at higher elevations, and there's plenty of pigs and goats and deers in select areas. Uh, you can kind of see our sweet plants here compared to others isn't as covered as we would like them to be, mainly just because uh, the area is hard to get through and we lack the proper tools and manpower to do a proper uh, sweep. Here's a couple pictures. I just want to describe how uh, the dispersed seeds versus the emerging seed heads look. Uh, you can see on the left, they're kind of old and kind of spent looking. Uh, they turn white and then tan, kind of dark. Uh, on the right, when they're just emerging, they're like this purple, shiny, uh, just beautiful looking tassels. And here, I just want to show the other range of uh, poly poly is uh, kind of up towards the 7,000 plus feet range. It's just this higher rocky shrubland. You can see the forest down below, cloud line. Here's that picture Billy was talking about where uh, it's just funny how we, we walk by this every every year, how many times, and uh, just so happens we we saw it. So it uh, goes, goes to show how cryptic this plant can be. Um, in, the, in the more wet areas, we can't just pull it out how we normally do. We have to use um, chemical means, uh, but we only use uh, one and a half percent. So uh, we're trying to minimize as much over overspray at all. Um, historically known as uh, Baokua, the area was thought only inhabited by spirits. The Waikamoi flume carries potable water to Kula residents over a mile throughout the Koolau Forest Reserve. Um, it was originally constructed out of redwood, redwood over a century ago. And today it's Pristine forests are inhabited by native birds, ferns, moths, lichens, and other old ohia kind of tree uh, forests. Um, there are ginger, blackberry, and other kind of non natives creeping in, uh, along with signs of pigs being found on the flume. Um, mainly, uh, the area is just kind of swampy, marsh like ridges, um, steep gulches. Um, multitudes of stream carved valleys that uh, lead to waterfalls and sometimes lava tubes. Uh, and here's some more pictures. Uh, the one on the left is just many of waterfalls we have to traverse. Uh, the picture in the center just kind of shows how we commonly find it next to the streams. Um, because of the terrain just being so gulch and valley-like, um, one can assume that's just how gravity works, going either up or down the, the valley. And the picture on the right uh, just goes to show how kind of hard it is to see, if you can imagine seeing that, and a bunch of other different grasses. There's a lot of lookalikes. Uh, 
the picture on the left is just another kind of stream photo. Uh, this is Ape Ape or Gunnera. Um, prime habitat for, for Pampas, basically. And the picture on the right uh, was a historical treated plant from air that we revisited on ground. And uh, in these areas, the, the seeds don't necessarily disperse as far just because of the, the thick, dense vegetation. So it's, it's important to go back to each, each place, even if we haven't been there before. Cooler residential areas um, are mainly permission-based and it's easy when they let us on their property with our trucks and we can just pull them out with a big chain or whatnot. Um, sometimes uh, we have difficulties getting permission access. So we have to do a lot of road recon. So um, one of the pictures on the left you can see is um, actually taken through a pair of binoculars. How we just found it on the road. And um, this main big picture is kind of one of our recent um, areas that we're having to revisit frequently. Here's just a couple of pictures showing the differences between Selawana and Jubata. Uh, Selawana on the left, you can see how fluffy and um, just thick the foliage is kind of hides the, the comb, the seed stalks. And uh, on the right, you can just see how they stick up, they're proud, the, the plumes are kind of more stringy and um, the foliage just is a lot less and kind of lower. Uh, one of the last areas that we uh, swept uh, last year was the National Park, Haleakala. And um, originally these points were historic points and we just so happened to find them by air. And um, we were kind of excited because, well, that just meant, well, hey, we got to go on foot. So that kind of led to a, a Couple couple day trips and it was it was nice. Um, here is just another picture showing how diverse the the ground is, but once you see it, it kind of sticks out and nothing else really looks like it. So um, it is kind of funny how it's hard to see in some areas and then other areas it just sticks out really. Um, I kind of just want to reiterate how fortunate I feel just for, this is just another day at the office, got to go check out these awesome zones and hopefully um, keep, keep them as pristine and beautiful for future generations. Um, here's just another picture of one of the areas that we found in the park. Um, you can kind of see on the left, there's the cabin, the Holua cabin, and uh, all in between there, all these ridges, there were uh, historical points. We were finding a couple this year last um, and uh, last year. There's just a easy pie graph to kind of show just the, the chunks of where we're spending most of our time or what we're covering the most. Uh, we're, we're covering the ranch and the flume uh, the most just because they're the kind of the easiest to access. They have ongoing permissions and we can kind of just get there and, and, and go where we need to be going without having to deal with um, other permission bases. Here's some more numbers, just kind of showing uh, what we did by air at, on the top. Um, 
haven't haven't quite been able to do too much statistical analysis on this, but uh, there's there's kind of a significant amount that we can treat uh, by air versus ground, just simply because we can't get to these areas. And um, on the on the flip side, some areas uh, are easier to get to on ground versus by air. So there's kind of a caveat there. Here's just another bar graph showing uh, what we found this, this last year. Um, you can kind of see we found a significant amount of immatures on the ranch, uh, mainly because they're, like I was talking about, they're tucked in these gulches with uh, gorse. So um, any seeds that happen to do uh, disperse are just kind of right there. So they just keep popping up. And so over time, we just got to keep tunneling through and retreating. Um, and you can kind of compare the Heliops with all the other ones in, in terms of it's, it's definitely a significant amount in a sense um, uh, of matures found just because we can, uh, we can see them easier. Here's just a few more uh, numbers for the data over the years. Um, you can kind of see basically the trends. There was, um, there's a downward trend of immature plants kind of found on the ground despite a similar if not upward trend across uh, the acres covered despite uh, we kind of lost um, another crew member in 2019 or so. Uh, you can see how there's more acres um, east covered this year just because uh, we haven't necessarily covered any uh, west targets by air uh, this last year. And here's just a picture showing um, kind of what West Maui looks like in terms of the sheer cliffs that are just lined with campus. So it's, it's difficult to uh, treat sometimes just even with a helicopter. So um, a lot further funding and or studies needed somehow with uh, other treatment methods. All right. So control methods, um, advantages and disadvantages. I'm just going to talk about more so the aerial advantages and disadvantages. Um, we can target mature flowering plants. Pampas is easy to find when it's in flower. Um, big tassels, big plumes, as you can see in the other slides. Um, kind of harder to see. Immature plants, though, uh, from the air. Um, sometimes these blades can just be like a few inches to six inches, you know, so um, pretty hard to see from air when everything's kind of blended in with other plants. The good thing about our aerial um, ability is we can survey in multiple locations, different zones. It can all be in one cycle, cycle meaning a whole two hour surveying flight, which we take um, looking for plants in a specific site population place that we know it's been found before over the years. Um, and sometimes we get clouded out, so we can go to different zones. Uh, we can start on East Maui and work away from the wet Mesic forest or come back into the drier areas if we get clouded out. Um, the only thing with the helicopter, obviously you cannot fly over residential areas, no matter how much you wanna fly over some of these zones, or you know that there might be some plants boring in those properties. Um, so, um, that's just the difficulty of that, but we can control plants by air, uh, plants that are hard for us to get to ground to pool or um, just in some steep gulches that we can't get on foot at all. It is costly and weather dependent. So um, we, we like to pick our specific season um, when it's gonna be flowering. That way it's easier to find targets before seeds get dispersed, but we can still see it by eye. Um, and then of course, Using the helicopter ensures quality logistics. And this is also like mapping 
uh, running trails or whatnot. For example, we flew over Waikamoi last year into a stream that we knew our plants were in and we seen it from the air. But before uh, flying there, it was impossible to get down. We tried a few times on foot. After the flight, after we passed by a few times, uh, we were able to find one ridge that we could take some webbing and some rope, kind of just uh, get ourselves down a little bit on foot, able to cross through the streams and then control the plant. So that was a pretty good ability using the helicopter for that. And then last but not least, we got the best views. Great, nice office. So you can see, uh, this is a street in a plant. One plant above, same plant below. This is three weeks later. This is just a different one, uh, kind of in between uh, Haleaka Ranch and Poli Poli. Uh, see, uh, we saw this by air. So we loaded up, treated it. There was a windstorm. This wasn't uh, any effects of the herbicide, by the way. So after that, we had to get there on foot because there's plenty of seeds and couple of plants that we missed. So just as a strategy, we got to revisit. So um, challenges and uh, or sorry, control methods, um, advantages and disadvantages for ground. Um, so ground advantages um, on foot, we trial the survey um, through these buffer zones of if we're passing through with a fine tooth comb. Um, this means like sweeping against each other, spacing out on a certain distance, we're able to get some good coverage. Um, also, uh, by monitoring that close proximity, we were able to locate small immature plants that we may not be able to see from air. So just like Ross has explained, we were at Halakala uh, in December. And after our flight cycle, um, we went down on foot and uh, we found more plants than what we've seen from air. So we found a few small immatures that were tucked in the rocks that are hard to find. Um, our overall goal uh, with Pampas, I learned over the years, is not really eradicating or um, terminating this plant, but it's a uh, suppression, initial suppression, because there's so much seed heads that you're dealing with and it's so invasive. Um, so it's just a matter of returning each year and just tending to where you think the populations may be, predicting certain zones or areas that you may have to control or survey and um, trying to get to the plant before any seed heads disperse. <clears throat> um, and then we get access to residential areas. So that's something that we can't do with a helicopter, but on ground, we're able to do that. And the ground disadvantages is difficulty surveying in remote areas. Um, it is hard to be that fine tooth comb type of thing uh, to go in more rugged terrain areas that are real denser with a lot of native plants. Um, so kind of getting into a big buffer zone doesn't quite help. So we kind of uh, decrease the buffer zone a little bit. Um, pampas growth on sheer vertical cliffs and gulches. Um, so sometimes we, we can't find the plant or we can't get to the plant, take a point, and we try to get to it by air later. And then, uh, of course, we have limited personnel this past year. Um, but despite that, we still got good coverage. Um, but it is hard with only two people in the field. And um, thick vegetation can be very time consuming um, just to travel a distance. You know, uh, someone who's not involved with conservation or doesn't walk in back remote areas, if you tell them, yeah, we walk a few miles in, in the preserve or whatnot, you know, you think a few miles is just real easy down and back, but uh, it's a lot of going up and down inside and left and right and docking, ducking and dodging. So 
Um, sometimes being on ground is a disadvantage. <clears throat> yeah, so of challenges and uh, solutions, um, a huge challenge for us this past year is dealing with recalcitrant properties or residential areas that we don't quite have um, either permission to get to or um, they cultivate pampas on their property and they've done their homework and El Silawana is not on our state noxious weed list. Maybe they're able to grow this plant on their property and we can't get to it. Um, so I think a big solution to that is just continuous education, trying to inform our residents, the community. Um, and then also we're taking little vouchers this year of sample plants that we think is Silawana or we know kind of just from experience of the eye that it's a Silawana plant. Um, we're just trying to see how far widespread Silawana is compared to the Jubata variation. And maybe hopefully one day we can get a great data point to kind of sketch out how invasive uh, Silawana is and possibly one day have it on the state noxious we list and have that thing updated um, sometime in the near future. Um, another challenge or challenges and um, solutions. Um, of course, we have limited personnel, so it's nice to collaborate with other people uh, having trade-offs. Um, here's an example down below in the little corner on the left, uh, doing some work with West Maui. Um, we did some work with East Maui just recent. Um, it'll be nice if some of those guys come with us too and work in the field, uh, clear some trails and some transects. Um, also the use of power tools. You could see like those thick vegetated areas that has tons of forest or blackberry. If you ever try to machete through blackberry, you know, it just flexes on you and bends and kind of can make it even worse. So um, small little tools that we can use that could be safe and essential in the field, maybe some type of sawzall or small miniature electric chainsaw or whatnot that can fit in our bag pretty easy. And then we had the opportunity last year also to work with um, our ops manager, Adam Knox, where we got to fly drones, a uh, drone survey in Halakla on the ranch. Um, this is nice because we could get a bird's eye view, not use uh, all the money and expenses of helicopter use and um, able to kind of navigate and set data points on where you think the plant may be or populated sites. Um, I think it's a great, use of a tool and I hope that we can have more of this use in the future. And then uh, you can see this is just uh, one more look at, at um, thinking about those ideas of solutions and applying it here. You know, if we had the personnel, um, some help with some other entities or distant trades and uh, also some minor rappel work or rappel training um, that we've been kind of utilizing last year uh, and continue this year. I think it's gonna help us uh, with a big advantage towards um, continuing our suppression of pampas grass on Maui. There's just a comparison between the dry areas and the wet areas, just how the foliage looks. Uh, on the left, it's kind of more stringy and yellowy versus on the right, it's just more lush and vibrant. There's a couple more. Uh, you can see the seed heads are different as well. Uh, the one on the left is kind of more straight up versus the one on the right is more flag, kind of tassel looking. Um, uh, the one on the left, the foliage is kind of more uh, shorter, more dyed back, kind of just more poofy, so to speak, versus the one on the right is, and you can't really see too much, but you can still see the, the leaf blades sticking out. So they're long, they're st stringy, whip-like, um, and yeah, just, just kind of hard to see in the, the thick veg without having the mature flag just sticking straight up saying, hey. So yeah, I just want to thank everybody. Um, 
guys have any questions, feel free to contact us. Here's all the corporations and organizations that we work with and we would like to work with again in the future real soon. And one more time, just thank you. Here's our contact info. If you got any pampas, let us know. You'll see Billy and I. And yeah, thank you, everybody. All right, mahalo, Billy and Ross. What a great presentation. And I just have to say the photos in your presentation are amazing. And it's always really great to see that kind of boots on the ground eye view of the work that's being done. So mahalo for that great update and presentation. Um, we do have a question in the chat. If you folks have any questions, please put them in the chat in the question and answer tab or in the Facebook Live comment section. Uh, Dr. Fern Duval, uh, who's also our MISC committee chair, he's asking if Haleakala National Park chips in on the 2020-2021 Pampas control work by providing MISC with Heliops costs or co-work? And this might be a big question for Mike as well, um, if Mike wants to answer it or if you folks feel prepared to answer. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, did, they did not, uh, to sum it up. Uh, what they, uh, they allow us access, which is a, a, a great thing. Um, but that's that's that was uh, the contribution this year. All right, mahalo. Any other questions for Billy and Ross in the chat? Uh, we have Terry Field saying really great and informative presentation. Thank you, Ross and Billy. Fern is also saying great <laughs> talk, Ross and Billy. Thanks for all you do. I really love how um, you folks just showed us you know, I, like I was tired after watching some of your presentation of just how arduous and thorough the work is. Um, and like you're saying, you know, a couple miles may not sound far when you're walking on something smooth and paved like in this picture, but you really gave us a picture of what that work is like and how difficult it could be um, to go through these areas and to protect Maui's watershed. So. Awesome, from Cynthia, amazing job. Congrats, Billy and Ross, you guys rock. Really great questions and comments. Another question, uh, what do you do once you find the pampas grass on foot? If you folks wanna answer, Mike, if you wanna jump in too. Um, well, when we find it on foot, we usually take a GPS data point um, just to give us a drop down of uh, some data of the location and possibly the time and even a little text of a description. Maybe it had a multiple seed heads. So we know in the future that that's gonna have to be a real, uh, I guess, priority spot to go check out. Um, but we initially just use a pick and uh, try to bust around the roots and pull out the ground and hang it um, is usually the best method. And if it has seed heads, um, which I felt to mention before, but uh, we usually clip the seed heads um, and bag them in a plastic bag, maybe double bag it, triple bag it, uh, just to make sure. And then we, uh, take it away to the landfill, dump it off and let it rot. So that's about it. Great. Yeah. Dig them up, get them. Um, another comment from Nikki Kamimoto, very informative. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I think that you guys make a really good point in just how um, detrimental this plant can be to our watershed. And, you know, it's a beautiful plant. That's why it was brought here. It's a beautiful ornamental. We see it used a lot in, you know, events and weddings and decor. But um, I think this really brings home the fact that this is not a plant we want in Hawaii. And there maybe are other alternatives to pampas that um, we can encourage others to use. So. Awesome. All right. Well, we have a couple more minutes left. Any other questions? Now is your chance. <laughs> um, Terry says, I heard that goats are used in the mainland for controlling nox noxious weeds. 
with an enzyme that kills the seed not to be eliminated and fertilized for further proliferation. Do our local goats aid in small or large ways to control noxious weeds? And I think maybe we saw that photo of a goat earlier eating pampas. So um, maybe kind of staying on pampas, do you think goats do some damage in the sense of helping to control that population or, um, or not? I would say they uh, do better than not, I guess, because um, when we're hiking kind of higher, higher elevations, we'll find those like munched plants. Sometimes, sometimes they're huge and you know that they potentially would be flowering, but thanks to the goats, they're kind of just flat, uh, just well manic yeah just well well manicured eaten so yeah i'd, I'd say they they kind of help in a sense of just it being there but at the same time i don't think they're seeking it out targeting it kind of situations yeah and i'm sure if they had you know like in haleafala if there was a nice juicy ahinahina silver sword next to a pampas they might be a little more inclined to go for a native right if they have that option but also as you've mentioned um pampas has these really intricate thick root systems so maybe the goats can help stem it back and maybe in some points like prevent it from flowering but as long as that root ball is there and maybe it's getting rained on it'll come back right so the best way to get it be digging it up. Yeah, good question though, Terry. Mahalo. Any other questions? Um, can goats, oh yeah, so Marianne, can goats spread the pampas grass if the seeds are eaten? So are you familiar if like something happens in the gut or do you think like a bird, can it spread? I'm not that familiar. We do have Dr. Fern Duval on here also who might be able to help us. But from your experience, do you folks know if goats are able to spread pampas? And Mike, you can chime in too. Yeah, I, I would not recommend goats as a, a, a control for pampas. And they do far more harm than good. Yeah. So seed wise though, if a goat was to ingest a pampas flower head that had maturing seeds on it and then was to go and eliminate that would that be viable seed i think that's what marianne is asking yeah well, i guess where it would be is uh, by the time the plant is in flower that means the foliage uh the foliage is is quite coarse uh usually, generally the goats and and other um you know grass eaters they they like it when it's tender when it first when it's first starting so yeah. yeah so yeah that grass is uh i mean just that name it has the corded area just means cutty grass. So it mm. cuts you up pretty good. So even their mouths are, are pretty rough. Uh, it would be pretty rough on their mouths. Yeah, mahalo. Yeah, Marianne, great question. I think I think the seed dispersal, the biggest issue with that is more of the windborne dispersal from those, you know, thousands of seeds that are coming up every season um, from one plant alone. So so the goats, yep, not not a good invasive versus invasive scenario, maybe for that situation. All right, well, last chance for any further questions. Great questions, everybody. Um, Fern is saying that birds, Fern Duval, birds would be mainly seed predators, um, but they don't play much of a role in dispersal or destruction. So yeah, it looks like the biggest um, disperser in this sense are humans and wind. All right, so if any other questions pop up, I just wanted to share um, coming up for Aloha Friday, the end of our week of Hi Sam. We have Friday, uh, February 18th, tomorrow from 10 to 11, uh, new detections and rapid response. Um, a Maui uh, Invasive Species Committee 2022 update from Ops Manager Adam Knox, who made a small cameo in this presentation. Um, we are gonna have that uh, for about an hour tomorrow. And so he'll be giving an overview of new early detection species that have 
arrived in Hawaii in the last year that we're responding to. Later on in the day at seven o'clock, we have the Native Hawaiian Plant Society uh, for an evening presentation. So I think Beth will drop the link in the chat um, of how to join, how to sign up, and then also watch previous recordings, including this one, which will be up shortly. And then we'll go into next week. So we've uh, traversed from the realms of Vaukua in the beginning of the month to Vaukanaka. And next week we'll be in our kahakai in our coastal and marine zone talking about aquatic um, and other invasive species in these areas. So please join us um, for the rest of the month of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Uh, with that, I just want to mahalo Billy and Ross again for this fantastic presentation and for sharing about the work they do and just for all the work that they do for Hawaii's environment. Mahalo nui everybody. We'll see you again soon.